Hey guys, remember the first half of the season of Jane the Virgin, this of course is season 3. Now, I know this is in fact a week late, I meant to review this last night, but last night was one of those nights where I was very tired and I just kept sleeping and sleeping and sleeping and sleeping. Throughout the whole night I was basically on and off and... I don't really know what was going on there or why I do this. This is something that I do a lot. It's a frequent occurrence, but enough like, enough about my really weird and uh, very outlandish sleep schedule because that really does not matter. Um, it's, but anyway, let's just jump right into this season because obviously I was very much looking forward to this season, especially when you have that cliffhanger at the end of season two. How does that not pull me in? I mean, I don't want you guys to think I didn't dislike that cliffhanger because I think it was a very well done cliffhanger. I think they handled it really, really well, and they really made us doubt whether or not Michael was going to live, and that suspense I think they did a really good job with throughout this first episode because there was no footage of anything it was just seeing jane's reaction and then saying a heartbreaking premiere jane the virgin season three uh you know at this time so they did a really good job of hiding what was going on but let's just jump right into season because let me just say that so far besides all that as a season i've really enjoyed season three season three is quite different than the first two seasons definitely it very much is a season of i think re um not regrets, but really like letting go and uh, revelations, as well as I think the aftermath of many things that occurred in season two, but I think it's been a really good season so far. I've really enjoyed it, and uh, definitely I'm going to talk about pretty much every major event that happened this season, all the major plot points, just all the stuff you guys want me to talk about, I will in fact discuss uh, in this video. But let's just jump right into it, starting off with, of course, the cliffhanger. Now, we left off last season with Michael near death, basically. We thought that he was uh, dead, of course, because he was, in fact, shot in the head, and you don't really recover from that a lot. So, this premiere is one of the most frantic uh, but emotional episodes of Jane the Virgin we've ever had. I think they did a really good job of showing how Jane and Michael met, you know, showing better times when how Jane met Michael, because we find out that Jane uh, met Michael basically through him being a police officer and uh, something that I don't exactly remember what he was doing, but he was doing some sort of investigation in her house, and these two just started to connect really well. You could tell that this was a guy that she really cared about and someone she really wanted to be with, and the way they would cut between that and then seeing Jane's reaction to what was going on now, I think just really shows Gina Rodriguez's range, and I think they did a really good job with that here, but you really don't know if Michael is going to live, and again, that suspense that they had here was kept really well throughout the episode because you have, you know, Z Jane's on the edge, Zoe's on the edge, and as well as Michael's mom, who we've always known that Zoe really does not connect well with, she's kind of in an awkward position because she has to connect with this woman, she actually has to bond with her, because the fact that, you know, they need to bond over something, you know, her child could die for, you know, her son could die for all she knows, so... I did like the way that these two eventually did patch things up. I did like the way that went. Uh, but there really were some tremendous sequences here, like us seeing how those two met, or hearing Jane talk about how much she loved Michael. But especially, I think the one that got to me the most is when you hear Jane talk about how she wants to grow old with him and how she's pictured a future where they're together and they grow old together, and that's how she knows that this is really who she wants to be with. It's just very rewarding. Uh, we've had a, you know, we had a whole season last year of her trying to figure out Raphael or Michael, and I like that this season she's committed. You know, there's no ridiculous love triangle or anything, which I don't think the triangle was ridiculous. I think it made perfect sense why she was so conflicted, but... I like that she has made a choice. I like that she does decide to be with Michael. But again, we don't know if Michael is really going to live through this. Uh, you know, Raphael's there to, to uh, help her out and everything. Well, he's not there, actually. He's busy with a completely different situation, which I'll get into. Um, but basically, you know, he, she doesn't really know if he's going to live. But in the end, Michael does, in fact, end up living. And I was very happy with this. I wasn't ready for them to kill Michael off. I don't think it would have been right for the show to do that. Jane the Virgin has never really been a tragic show. Like, there have definitely been tragic events that happen, you know, such as, um, something like, say, you know, uh, uh, you know, Raphael's mother dying, or, uh, something like, say, you know, what happened to, you know, what ha what's happened to Jane and Raphael with them breaking up, but nothing really that tragic, and especially getting Jane and Michael this far, it wouldn't really have made sense to then kill him off, so I like that he does, in fact, stay alive, and... It's great to see Jane, you know, Michael's still not the best, but I do like the way that Michael was alive. 
I liked that everyone was there to see it. I thought it was a very well done reveal. And what I really liked is that they really did take their time with this. Last year, if you remember, we had that cliffhanger about Mateo resolved in 10 minutes. No, this lasted an entire episode. We really didn't know it was going to be. And I think all of those flashbacks is of seeing Jane and Michael and her having that flash forward with Michael, I think just really made this that much more impactful. I was very happy to see that Michael was alive, but that's really only the half of it. There's a lot more surrounding their relationship, and that's probably my favorite aspect of this season, really, is these two really having to tackle married life. So this is why I was very happy to see that Michael was still alive, because the rest of this season with Jane and Michael, I found to be very, very compelling. You know, they have a completely different life now. They're married, so they have to stay committed to each other, and there's a lot of stuff that they have to deal with, especially the fact that Michael was in fact shot, and Jane is pretty much terrified. In fact, the second episode of this season, I think is one of the show's best, honestly. I really loved everything about this second episode, because... Jane starts having nightmares, that she is having these nightmares that anytime Michael is going to leave the house, that there's going to be a gunshot that goes off, or that something bad is going to happen, and she is terrified of him leaving, you know, she knows that he's on bed rest and that he's getting better, but at the same time, she really doesn't want him to leave, and the way that they deal with this, I thought was very interesting to see, because you can tell that Michael can tell that Jane is hurt, and it really, I think, shows this season more than ever how much these two work as a couple, and how much they really know each other. Each other and why they're so compatible. Michael is always willing to sacrifice for Jane, and Jane is always willing to give in to Michael. Like, And what I mean by giving to Michael is that she knows what Michael wants, and he knows what she wants, but at the same time, they make these sacrifices together all the time, and that is definitely one of the biggest parts of a relationship is sacrifice, but... At the same time, while he is making all of these sacrifices for her, which I'm sure Jane does appreciate, she doesn't really want him to. And that big aspect, of course, is him going back to work. Because she knows it's going to happen. She knows he wants to be a police officer again. And she knows that he wants to get to go back to work. And that's something that Michael is very focused on. But at the same time, he kind of is worried because he doesn't want her to have to go through something. He can tell that she obviously is not ready for him to go back to work. So he actually decides to start for a little bit and take some time to not go back to work because it just isn't really it's not it's not that it's not safe that's not really what it is it's that Jane deep down just doesn't really want him to leave yet you can definitely tell so I thought it was definitely uh very interesting to see the way that whole scene was done uh, with them talking about, you know, what they're really going through, I just thought everything they did in the second episode, you know, showing her uh, being so worried about that, I just thought it was really interesting to see. And uh, he even makes her, like, he, and he really does everything he can to make her not be afraid of a gun. He even takes her shooting just to show her, you know, in case she needs a gun, in case she needs to shoot at something. I just thought he really did do everything for her. And, I mean, Michael really is the best. Like, I, Michael, like, they're really, you can't really get more better than Michael when it comes to uh, loyal people and relationships. Not just boyfriends or husbands. You can't really get anyone more loyal than Michael. I mean, Michael will do everything for Jane. He is the ideal um, relationship. Like, I really think he is the ideal partner, and I think they've shown that very well this season. Um, but at the same time, he is, of course, on... Uh, you know, he is in therapy where he is trying to recover from his wound and everything, and he's told that he does have some time to wait. The biggest thing to him is when they're going to have sex, because this is something that they definitely talked about. They were going to have sex that night, and they still haven't, and it's obviously kind of, it's in the back of Jane's mind, but at this point, you know, she's not really worried about that. She's more focused about him going back to work, and the worry that she has for that, you can tell that she's obviously very worried but then they eventually find out, uh, one, they do have a talk together where, you know, she tells him that she understands that he's going to have to go back to work. She understands that things are going to be different, and she knows that eventually he is going to have to, um, you know, have to go back at some point. So I really did like the way that ended. Uh, I liked the whole thing that they went through, uh, you can tell that obviously, you know, things actually do get kind of tough between those two, you can definitely, you know, you can definitely tell things definitely get tough, but I like the way that they solved this together, I like the way they decided that, you know, he is going to go back to work, but he's not going to work at the same type of thing just for her, and I, I like the way that that whole scene was done, I just thought everything about that was really good. But then we get to the end of this episode, uh, where we actually find out 
that Michael, that uh, Jane and Michael, you know, Michael actually has healed two weeks uh faster than they thought, so they actually do have the ability to have sex now, so they rush to their house, and I thought that was definitely very funny to see, but then we get to the biggest change of all, which of course is Jane, our title of the show is Jane the Virgin, as we know, but as we know, Michael wanted to have sex with her, and that's definitely, well, she wants it too, obviously, but that's definitely a big part of episode three, is her having to not be a virgin anymore, because throughout episode three, there is this fear that it's not going to go well, you know, the timing isn't right, but then one night, they have the perfect timing, everything seems to be going well, but then the worst thing could happen, and she actually ends up making a sex tape of their, um, of their whole first time to her, to, you know, her boss and everything, because she wanted her to write a call, she wanted her to send her her, uh, her novel, and instead she ended up sending, not the first draft, she ended up sending the sex tape instead, and she has to try to retrieve the sex tape, and yes, it's a little bit silly, but it definitely was very funny to watch, I thought they did a really good job with that, so that was definitely very funny, uh, but the biggest thing I really did love about this episode is Jane's fear of that first time, that it did not go well right, because she really realizes that she ha faked her orgasm, that she actually didn't have a real orgasm, and that is a big deal, really, when it comes to sex. I mean, she didn't really feel actual pleasure for him, you know, she didn't really feel satisfied, so he starts to get very worried, you know, she tries to hide this from him, but there's only so far she can go, she eventually does tell him, and that's something I do like about Jane and Michael, is that they don't really hide anything from each other, you know, they try, but in the end, they end up finding things out, and I think it's a very realistic way to portray a relationship here. But either way, like I said, you know, Jane's very worried that her first time didn't really go right, so she's destined to spice up their relationship, but it just isn't really working out. You know, she tries to use this, uh, this, this, um this, like, liquid, but it, like, burns her and things like that, so really, it just isn't really working out for them in terms of timing, and not just timing, but, you know, their timing is pretty bad, but also the fact of, you know, them trying to spice things up isn't really working out, and then we get to the whole idea of why Jane is so upset about it, because her virgin, her virginity was a part of her, that was something that made her her. I mean, the show is called Jane the Virgin because we know how important that virginity was to her, and having that lost is not really something that Jane is used to, but it's gone now, and she's gonna have to deal with it, and I thought just seeing that whole scene where you really do see her, and she's genuinely upset that she lost her virginity, not because of how it turned out, because, you know, sure, the sex went well, you know, they, yes, she faked her orgasm, there was that, but there was also the fact that she did enjoy it, and that definitely is true, and I really did like the way things went there, I thought their whole thing, um, with the way that was done, I definitely really did enjoy, I like seeing Jane uh, go through this, you know, being very conflicted with was it good or was it not, but in the end they do decide to have sex again, and again I like that this was something that was a problem, but they eventually did find very, very right, and they realized how to do it, I really did love the cartoon uh, fantasies as well, I thought that was very funny, because obviously they can't really show it on the CW, but I thought that was definitely funny to see, I definitely really enjoyed that, and episode 3 in general, I really did love, it was probably my favorite episode of the season, and I think it just very well shows how great these two really are together, and I think they handled that for the most part really, really well. Um, but then we get to episode four, which doesn't really have a ton for Jane and Michael, really. There's not a ton for them to do in this episode. A lot of it is very focused on Petra and what's going on there, which we'll get into Petra's plot in a little bit. Their main thing is that they are trying to move in together, and Jane actually does get an apartment with Michael, and this is something that Zoe and Alba are not really used to, you know, they're used to her being at the house, they're used to her have being in their company, and she's not, and it's something that Jane isn't really used to either, you know, she obviously is starting to, uh, feel a little bit, not left out, but she just kind of misses, you know, her being there, and her always having her mom, and her always having Alba, but they're not there, that's just not how it is for her, so I, I thought stuff like that was really well done here, I really did enjoy the way that whole, that all went, and, uh, Again, there isn't a ton, really, with Jane in this episode. There's stuff going on with, uh, Jane and, um, and Lena, but just in general, there really wasn't a ton going on in terms of Jane and Michael, but I thought for the most part they handled that stuff really, really well here. 
Now let's get to the other big aspect of this, which is Jane and Raphael, because their dynamic is, a, is something completely different this season. As we know, Raphael told Jane that he still loves her, but he understands that she wants to be friends, and that is the struggle that they go through this season, is that they are doing what they can to be friends, but obviously it's very awkward. You can tell that he still has feelings for her, you can tell that I think he still does want to be with her, but at the same time he's trying to get over her, and it's not exactly the easiest thing to do, but episode 2 you start to see he's a lot more defensive in terms of Mateo. He's much more um, vocal about his opinion. He very much likes to make sure things go his way. And I wouldn't really say this is Raphael being a douchebag. This is just him being a little bit more assertive. Now that he really doesn't see her as his future wife or as a possible love interest, now he's going to treat her like she's, you know... She is, in fact, Mateo's mother, but he's going to treat her like a friend. He's going to treat her like, a, you know, someone that, uh, you know, he deserves to be heard. And I like the way that that was all done because, yeah, they do have very diff different types of conflicts. You know, they're very conflicted and they have a very different types of views when it comes to Mateo. And that was also really compelling to see. Like, in episode two, they had this whole struggle with do they really want to take Mateo to preschool? You know, Raphael thinks that Mateo's too young. Jane thinks it's exactly the right age, and they actually end up solving it through the preschool. Like, they actually end up confront, uh, talking about it, and it was actually a really well-done scene. And again, what I like here is that these two are, in fact, trying to move past it. Like, they are still trying to be friends, and I really did enjoy that. And then once we get to episode 5, it very much focuses on Jane and Raphael's relationship, because... Michael tries to bond with Raphael, doesn't exactly work, the two literally have nothing in common whatsoever, which I like that, I like that these two aren't friends, because you don't always need to put uh, the former boyfriend and the boyfriend and make them best friends, that's something completely unconventional that the show has done that I really haven't seen uh, very much before, and I like that these two don't at all want to be friends, like, they just, they don't really have anything in common, um, but we do see that Raphael decides that he actually wants to start dating again. We don't really know uh, who he wants to date or what really that's all about. But the big thing about episodes, uh, you know, about uh, what's going on here, you know, we see that, like I said, he really does want to date again, and he's trying to get back out into that world, and they're also trying to create, you know, a really nice friendship and everything. Rogelio and Raphael actually end up getting very close, so, and I'll get into that when we get to uh, Rogelio's plot, but I thought this was very well done overall. I thought what they did with Raphael this season was really good. We'll get to the stuff I know you guys want me to talk about in a little bit, but that's pretty much everything to really talk about in Jane and Michael's arc, but Besides one other really big revelation that I do want to talk about. So the only really other big thing to talk about is what's going on between Jane and Alva this season. Because we have a new revelation that we really didn't know before. And this is something that I thought was very interesting to hear. Uh, I like that still in season 3, there is still stuff that we're finding out about Alva. But we eventually find out that basically uh, we know something went on between Alba and uh, her sister Cecilia. She holds very much disdain for Cecilia. She wants nothing to do with her. And Jane doesn't really understand what she could have done. But we eventually find out that uh, Cecilia basically was the one who told her father that her and Mateo, that uh, she was no longer a virgin when she and Mateo, not Mateo, Jane's son, obviously, Mateo, her, um, you know, her husband, um, that he, that she was no longer a virgin. And this is something that Jane at first is upset about. But then is thinking that this is something she should embrace, that the fact that she wasn't a virgin anymore, that uh, everyone knew, and that you should embrace it, so... You can see that they definitely do have conflicting views, but Jane wants to know more about this family. You know, this is a whole family she didn't know about, and she wants to find out more, and she ends up contacting her, um, you know, Cecilia's uh, daughter, Catalina, who ends up, who lives in London, and... Alba at first is very upset because she doesn't trust Catalina, but Jane and Catalina hit it off right away. You can tell that Catalina has this big life, you know, she is very successful with what she does, and uh, she starts to bond with them, you know, she's very spontaneous as we know, you know, Jane is not really spontaneous at all, she kind of just jumps at things, and Jane starts to get a little bit jealous of her to the point where she starts to wonder if she has a boring life, like, she starts to think that maybe she has a boring life, maybe she's just not as exciting, and I think the contrast between these two is very interesting to see, you can tell there's something about Catalina that we just can't trust, you don't really know what it's about, but you just don't really trust her, and, uh, 
Alva starts to feel very distant from Jane, we definitely see, but Jane does agree to meet Catalina for dinner, and it goes well at first, but then Catalina tells Alva that her grandmother's sorry that she ruined her wedding, but it was hard for her grandmother because she was in love with Mateo first, and Alva stole away from her, and I did like that eventually Alva and, uh, you know, Catalina, I did like that Jane and Alva did in fact make amends, that Alva still doesn't trust her, but she understands why Jane wants to get in touch with her, it's just that those two will never really be that close, so we definitely see that. And uh, what I really did like, like I said, the whole aspect of Jane and this boring life, I thought was very funny to see, especially Michael trying to prove to her that he's not boring when he's saying locked it a heaven and then they bought that cat. I thought that was pretty funny, definitely. But also Raphael starts to kind of take an interest to her because he doesn't really have anyone that he's with. He starts to want to be with Catalina, and they start to have some sort of a connection. We don't really know what that's about, but they actually end up sleeping together, we see very quickly. They do, in fact, end up sleeping together. I like the fact that he did ask Jane's permission for this because he just thought it was weird that he dates her cousin, but I did like the way that all turned out. I thought it was definitely uh, funny to see. So that's basically everything that happens with Jane and Michael until we get to the finale, which we'll get into the finale in a little bit. Um, but that's everything with Jane and Michael. Now let's jump into what I think is the most compelling out of the other arcs of the season, which is Zoe's arc. So in general, I was very interested in seeing where Zoe was going to go uh, this season, as we know, because of the way things left off in season two. And I like that she didn't try to hold it back from Ruff, from uh, from Rahelia. Like, she straight up told Rahelia right off the bat that she is, in fact, pregnant. And it is, of course, with, as we know, you know, it's it's, Est it's Esteban's baby. And this is something that Rogelio is obviously upset about, but it's not really something that he has control over. And I like that at first he was upset, but he does tell her to do whatever it is that she wants to do. And she realizes right away she does not want this baby. She doesn't want this baby. It's just not something that she's ready for for, you know, she told him straight out she doesn't want kids, and needless to say, Rogelio is a bit upset, you know, he wants to be with a woman who does want kids, and that's, like, the one reason why these two can't really be together right now, which is really sad, honestly. I, I really do like Rogelio and Zoe, but until she decides to have kids, which I don't think she ever will, these two cannot be together, and until Rogelio can respect that and move on from that, it's gonna take a while for those two to really be able to move on from that, and I thought that was definitely interesting to see, um, but a lot of the arc does not revolve around that. I'm sure we'll get more into that in the second half of the season. The rest of this arc deals with her and her singing careers. We know she does want to be a singer. This is something she decides to push at a lot, and, uh, she goes to this one audition, it ends up going well, but then she's asked a question that she never really asked herself, and that is, what else do you want to do in life if you can't make it as a singer? Which is something that Zoe has never really thought of. She's always thought of singing as the only career for her, as the sole thing that she wants to do, and she really doesn't have any other options. So when she's given this chance to think of something else, it really does great on her because she needs to really think, you know, is this really what I want to do or is it just that I have no other options? And basically, Raphael, not Raphael, Rogelio, I always do that. I don't know why I mix up their names, but I always do. Rogelio and Jane, uh, they want to do what they can to try to get her back on track because they feel that this, hap this happened to her before. She loses, you know, she loses motivation. She loses focus. So they get Gloria Estefan and Emilio Estefan to interview Zoe, but Jane completely messed it up by telling them that Zoe is not really interested, that Zoe wants to move on, and that maybe singing isn't the right thing for her. But in the end, it kind of ends up being a blessing. Now, Zoe obviously is kind of upset at first, but I did like that Zoe genuinely thought of what to do here because she starts to come up with things that she wants to do. And basically through this idea of her um, at this dance recital where she's working in an office and it's this job that she really doesn't like. She's like a secretary to this guy and she's just not really not really something that she's really into. She's not really into this whole idea. Uh, it's just not really something that you could see her wanting to do. And, you know, I, I definitely liked that Zoe tried to do something different. I like that she genuinely did try to turn things around here. Um, but you can tell that this is really not something that, that she wants to do. But as we know, she also does help out, you know, this, it's, you know, she, cause she tries to do different careers. But as we know, you know, she's also a coordinator of dances. And, you know, 
she likes to help kids learn how to dance. And basically through this one recital, she starts to realize that what she's wanted isn't singing, but that she wants to open a dance school. And that is what she's going to try to do. She's going to try to open this dance school. She's going to do what she can to make sure that this dream comes true. And that's where we leave Zoe at the end of the season. Well, there's one other thing going on with her, but I really did love this arc. I thought this was very interesting overall. And it's really this more interesting thing that, again, Zoe hasn't really thought about. It's kind of a midlife crisis, kind of not. But I like the way that Zoe never really contemplated this question. And now she's really starting to realize, you know, what's really going on there. I thought that was definitely interesting to see. And I really did like that. But then we get to this other guy, Bruce, who... Bruce is someone who is one of Zoe's ex-boyfriends who she finds to be a total douche and really wanting nothing to do with, but he ends up turning back up into her life, and she very quickly finds out that he actually is in fact divorced, and you can tell that he definitely still has some feelings for her, and she might too, and uh, Rogelio at first is a little bit jealous, because again, you can tell that he, a part of him does want to get back with her, you can definitely tell, uh, but at the same time, you know, she decides to actually go with Bruce, these two seem like they're going to start a relationship, and We'll get more into that, but I uh, I did like the way that that went. And that that plot is beginning, like it hasn't really started. I think it's going to start more in the second half of the season, but I really did love everything with Zoe's arc. I thought it was very interesting so far, and I'm very interested in seeing where it was going to go. I think this is probably the best plot for me that Zoe has had yet. Yeah, besides her not wanting to have kids, I thought that was really done la well done last season, but I really like what they did with her. Zoe continues to be one of my favorite parts of the show, and I think arcs like this are really showing us why she's such a great character. So now we get to my one complaint with this season, which, in my opinion, while I think most of the arcs this season are, for the most part, so far at least, very well fleshed out and uh, very well done, there's one arc that I just don't feel had much going for it and ended up being very repetitive, and that is Petra's arc. And it kind of is this point, because it was one of the things I was most looking forward to as we know, we had that great twist with Aneska pretending to be Petra, and now Petra is in the hospital, and, you know, we don't really know what's going to happen there. And while I think this was really good, we don't focus on it nearly enough because Yao Robbins, uh, you know, the actor, the actress, is actually not in two episodes of this season, so far at least, you know, uh, Yao Grob, yes, I mean... Uh, she's not in two episodes of this season, so it is definitely an inconvenience to see that she's not here. They do make good use of her. Don't get me wrong. They make good use of her. I just found a lot of it to be very repetitive, but we jump into it, and it starts off well enough. You know, we see Aneska. She's plotting behind Petra's back. You know, she's trying to become like Petra. She, you know, this is all a plot of Magda's, you can tell. Magda's trying to get her to get intel and steal money and things like that and basically take the company. But she starts this relationship with Scott, who we know, of course, Scott is, in fact, Petra's assistant, who she really wants nothing to do with. But Aneska starts a an affair with him, basically. Uh, you know, we see what's going on with that. So that was definitely interesting. And she ends up asking Scott for dirt on Raphael. And, uh, basically, you know, she's trying to turn against Raphael and everything, but a lot of this grew very repetitive. It grew as just her going back to Scott or being a, a bitch to Raphael, not wanting anything to really do with him, and I just didn't really feel they did as much with this as they could. And a lot of times, to be honest with you guys, I kept forgetting that Nesca was Petra. If it wasn't for the narrator saying, oh yeah, that's actually Nesca, then I would have completely forgotten. And, uh, I think that it maybe that's a testament to how great you Grog Glass is as both of these characters, but I just don't really feel they really did much with this because very quickly in episode 5, Raphael begins to notice that there are signs going on that something's not right, and after a certain point, Petra does in fact come out of her shell. She tells, you know, Oneska that this is over, that she's not doing this anymore. We find out that she's heard every single conversation that uh, Raphael has had with Oneska, and we end things strong enough with, you know, Petra saying that she was, is mad at Raphael because, not because of the fact that he, you know, was with Aneska and that he had sex with Aneska and everything. He's more mad at Raphael because of the fact that he didn't notice that there was anything off about her. He claims to be in love with Petra and want to be with her, but he didn't notice that there was anything off about her. And this obviously very much pisses her off. And I think she was very justified with what she did here, you know, with her not wanting to, you know, it, it, she was very justified in her claims with, you know, saying why Raph, why she should be mad at Raphael, because I definitely do agree she should be mad at Raphael uh, for what happened there, but uh, basically, 
you know, she decides that she's going to take care of the company. She fires, she straight up fires him, says, no, I'm going to leave this company on my own. I don't want anything to do with you. Um, I'm very mad at you, and this is how I'm going to uh, repay you because you didn't notice that there was anything wrong with me, so I'm just going to treat you that way. So I thought that made sense why she went in that direction. I thought it was a good direction for her character to go in. And as far as Nesca, really nothing else happens except for the fact that she does end up breaking up with Scott, who she was briefly engaged to, but she does end up breaking Breaking up with him. It takes a while for Scott to get over it. Uh, we definitely see, but uh, we eventually find out that uh, basically Scott actually had uh, blackmail with Raphael, and Raphael told Scott to blackmail Petra because he knew that she would run run to him for help, and then she would let him keep his hotel shares in exchange for the help. So Scott actually helped Raphael, and Raphael finally told him that he was with Inesca, not Petra, and he also promised to do Scott a favor later in exchange. So I do like the direction that they're trying to go with Raphael trying to get the company back. I just felt that besides everything going on with Scott and Inesca, they just didn't really do much else. I mean, yeah, she did kind of sad sabotage a relation with Jane, but they already were kind of on thin ice from what happened in season two anyway, so I definitely do feel bad for Petra. I definitely think it's going to be interesting to see where she goes from here with everything with Inesca, but it just seemed like they didn't really do much with this. They could have easily stretched this out for the first half of the season, then by the second half she could have found out what was going on, but no, it only lasted five episodes, which typically does happen with this show. I just felt this wasn't nearly as fleshed out as it could have. I think they could have done a lot more with this, and for me, this is the weakest part of the show so far. I am interested in seeing where she's going to go. I just felt that compared to how great everything else was, this wasn't nearly as good. And then the only other major plot to really talk about before we then get to the finale is, of course, Orkelio. Not a ton to talk about here, but Passion of Sanders, as we know, is a very popular show. In the first episode, he has all these fans coming up with him for, like, a semen sample or something like that. PP sample, actually. It was a very weird plot was going on. It was funny, but it was just a little bit strange. It's not really till episode three that his plot really kicks off, and that is that Passion of Santos is so successful that they want to make an American adaptation of it at the CW, and there's so many great CW references here, so many great jokes with the CW, how they have a superhero show every night, uh, how they're such a great network, but nobody seems to know what they are, even though they're so great, nobody seems to know. I thought that was hilarious, the way they poked fun at the CW, because of course they're on the CW, uh... Just some really great, I think, uh, play on words there. There was just some really good stuff with that. I thought that was a lot of fun. But either way, uh, at first, Rogelio is not into the idea because they want to cast Rob Lowe as the main star in Passion of Santos. And he wants to be the one to play Santos because, you know, he's very famous for it. And he thinks that there really isn't anyone else that should do it but him, but he eventually does get into the idea. He decides that he is going to go along with it, even though... He doesn't really know if it's really what he wants. I thought that was definitely interesting to see. Uh, but you can tell that definitely, you know, he's going to do whatever he can to get the parts. Uh, you know, he will definitely try to get this role. And even he finds uh, that he can get this role as this sexy, as, as like this baker or whatever. Well, this, essentially a sexy baker on the show is what he's going to be. And it turns out that... Uh, She's actually, this girl Amanda that he's talking to is actually a sexy one, is a fitted electric blue off the shoulder dress with like a, the, like this cleavage showing cutouts, and what she wants is for PYT, Raphael, to be her plus one to a charity event, essentially. That's what she really wants, and this really starts to hurt uh, Rogelio, you know, he really thought that she wanted this and things like that, so he obviously does get a little bit upset about that, but it does form this interesting dynamic with Raphael that I really enjoyed, where these two are starting to support each other, and Rogelio's starting to see the appeal for Raphael. Raphael's kind of bouncing off of Rogelio. I don't like it as much as Rogelio and Michael, but I thought it was definitely fun to see. I definitely really enjoyed that. I've always said that Rogelio is one of my favorite parts of the show, and that still does stand this season, and, uh, Basically, he does eventually get the role on the show. Um, we see that he is, in fact, going to have to... He does start to realize that he does have feelings for Zoe. Uh, but like I said, that kind of is ruined when we realize that uh, Bruce is back in the picture. So that's kind of ruined at first. But uh, we can tell that, you know, Rogelio, they try to have, uh, you know, a civil friendship between those two. But it actually does seem to work out for the most part. And that's something that I definitely did enjoy. I thought Rogelio's plot was a lot of fun to watch. We'll get more into that in the finale, 
but overall, I thought their stuff was really fun. I really enjoyed it overall. And that's pretty much everything that happens to the finale. Let's get into the finale, talk about where I really think it's going to go, because there really is a lot that happened in the finale, so let's just jump right into it. So there's a lot to really unpack with this finale. A lot definitely does happen. I thought for the most part this was a very strong mid-season finale. I don't know why we did seven episodes and not eight episodes. Seems like they cut down the amount of episodes every single year. I get that we only have 20 episodes a season, which I think is fine because I do think the show maybe has one or two duds every season. This keeps them from doing that. Uh, but I thought this was a really strong finale and I really enjoyed it overall. So there really is a lot to talk about. The big stuff going down this episode has to do with church. Uh, the fact that Jane hasn't gone to church in a while uh we know that definitely there's something going on there but the big question is you know she wants uh mateo to be baptized in church she knows that it's a little late but she wants it to go down and Raphael, you can tell isn't as into the idea but they decide that he is in fact going to get baptized in the church so I did like the way that that is going. You can tell throughout this entire episode there's some sort of reveal, and the episode's done like a Hitchcockian thriller, which I thought was really, really cool the way they did that. One of the show's uh, best things they've done. I think it's always cool when the show kind of turns itself in its head and tries to be something different, and they did it really well here with turning it into like a Hitchcockian type thriller, because um, we know throughout the entire episode there's some sort of envelope that's going to change everything. We don't really know what that's about, but... Raphael starts to uncover some secrets about the church, and he starts to have some flashbacks that he's been in this church before, and that he's had some sort of relationship with the nuns, and he really doesn't know what's really going on here, but Jane decides to distract uh, Mother Constantine, even though it is not the right nun, and she does what she can to distract the nun, but through her trying to distract the nun, she starts to realize that the reason that she is so against church, and that she doesn't want to go back there, is not not because of the fact that she didn't like church it's because this this is the place you know this is where we know that michael was shot and god she didn't feel you know he didn't deserve it god wasn't on his side with that and she's not really into the whole idea right now and i like the way that this was sort of like catharsis for her to get over what happened i thought that was really well done the way that that all went down and that's something that i definitely really did uh enjoy seeing and uh I definitely thought that was very interesting, definitely finding out that, uh, basically, you know, Jane was so upset at this nun because then she hadn't been to church because of the fact that what happened to Michael, and we'll get into that in a little bit because there is something that happened to Michael that, uh, we are going to talk about, but they go to the church and we know that there's some something in the envelope that Raphael's given, but we don't find out till the end of the episode, and the rest of the episode, we have a bunch of other stuff going on. Zoe does, in fact, reveal that she knew that Bruce was married when they got together officially. So, Bruce is divorced now, but he was married then, and you can tell that she does want to be with him. So, I'm wondering if Zoe and Bruce are, in fact, going to be in a relationship. Is this actually going to work out for them? I like that Zoe is doing this on her own, and I like that Rogelio seems to be going on his own as well, because he wants a baby mama. He wants to be able to have a baby. He realized in the last episode that if he can't be with Zoe, he's going to be with someone else, but he will do whatever he can to find, a, you know, a, a baby, and uh, he doesn't know exactly who he wants it to be, but he has a bunch of different dates, one with Carmen Electra, one with Denise Richards, and one with Brooke Burke Charvart, not Charvet, none of them really goes out that well, and... Basically, he finds out that uh, Darcy Factor, his matchmaker, actually wants to be the one to have a baby with him. Nothing, you know, create nothing serious, but something completely platonic, something where she will, in fact, uh, you know, be the mother of his child. Uh, she is going to have, you know, the baby, and I'm wondering if this is really going to work out between him and Darcy, if he's going to have feelings for her, or if there's going to be something more there. Is it just going to be something where they have a baby together, or is there something more behind that? That's something I'm definitely looking for. Forward to so I really did like the way things left off with Rogelio. I thought that was very strong. And then uh, Catalina, we find out can't be trusted in this episode. We definitely know there's something going on with her because by the end of the episode, even though she did have something with Raphael, she's with some other man. He's French. He's telling her a great job. And I like that this is in Jane's family and not Raphael's family. I'm kind of sick of in Rose Rose. You guys know anything going on with Rose and Louisa? I just don't care. I really don't. I'm kind of sick of that whole plot. I really wish the show move on from it but uh i did like seeing um that uh you know catalina is in fact part of something we don't know what that's all about but we'll get more into that uh but the big twist of course in this episode we have two big twists 
One, Michael finds out at the very end of the episode that he actually can't return to the Force yet. He's not ready to do this. He's not uh, ready, and he actually failed his uh, PT test, so he can't get back to being a policeman, which means he might have to change up his... Uh, I mean, being a detective, so he might have to change things up. He can only be behind the desk. He can't actually be a full-on detective. He can only really do desk work, and that's something that Michael's really, I think, going to have to decide in the second half of the season if he really wants to do. But then, of course, the even bigger reveal so we find out that Raphael was kept in a convent um, because of the fact that, uh, you know, we saw that he was in this church and he was kept there because we find out that not only was he not born in America, but he was actually born in Italy and that Elena and Emilio, who he thought were his parents, are actually not his biological parents. And for some reason, Elena, uh, made Mother Superior, gave Mother Superior all this money, so she never told her about it. And that is the way this episode ends. That is how we end the season finale overall. Really interesting stuff and definitely some very interesting directions to go in the second half of the season, but let me just get into it and talk about where I think we're going to go from here. So like I said, there's really a lot to talk about when it comes to this finale. A lot really did happen, and that's something I was very happy to see, is that I think last year not as much happened, and this year a lot happened. Like, they really did a great job at leading us on some really potentially really interesting cliffhangers, especially with Raphael, because in the beginning of the season, his biological mom supposedly died, Elena died, and uh, now we know that Elena Dino wasn't even his biological mother. So everything we've seen, you know, with Louisa, they're not actually his biological family. Who they are, we don't know. But that definitely is going to change things up with the way that Raphael takes this news. I'm assuming this is really going to change. I mean, if you found this out and you are Raphael's age and you all this time have thought that this was your family and everything you've been doing has been protecting your family, you know, you've run a hotel uh, because of your family. Everything you do pretty much is for your family. You know, Raphael is a very family kind of guy. Realizing this isn't his family, I think, is really going to change the fabric of who Raphael really is, and I'm definitely interested in seeing where this is going to take him, because I really don't know. That definitely is going to be very interesting to see. I'm very much looking forward to seeing how that reveal is done. They did such a great job with that reveal, too. We knew something was in that envelope, and th by the end of the episode, I liked it immediately we found out, and then it just ended, because where do we go from there? I have no idea. That's going to be very interesting. But now there's Michael as well. You know, Michael, uh, I think the one thing that he wanted was, of course, to go back to the Force. Jane wanted that. Jane, as much as she didn't want it, understood that that's something that he wanted. And now he can't. He's going to have to work at a desk job. And does he really care that much? Or is he going to try to find a new career? We don't really know. Uh, that's going to be very interesting to see is where Michael's really headed because... That's something I was very surprised about, especially, like I said, in a show that's not full of failures. I was surprised to see that Michael failed and that he actually isn't going back to the Force yet. So that's something I'm interested in seeing, is seeing Michael do something else. I have liked seeing Michael not as a detective this season, because I think Michael's been good, but a lot of times he's been there just to be a detective when he's not with Jane. And I think they've done a good job at making him more of a presence this season, which I've really enjoyed. Um... And that's something I thought was very well done. And I'm interested in seeing where Michael's really going to go in that regard. But is Rogelio really going to have this child with Darcy? Uh, is, again, is there something deeper there? Are they going to start to have a connection? I don't really know. That's going to be interesting as well. Catalina, we know, is definitely not to be trusted. I don't know really what she's doing, but something about her, we know we can't trust her. Who this man is, and if they're connected to Sin Rostro, I really have no idea. I'm assuming that it's a completely different, they're a completely different type of gang, but again, I have no idea. I think that's going to be very interesting to see. And I guess the only other thing to talk about is what is going to happen with Zoe. Is she going to end up with Bruce? Is she going to decide to pursue a relationship or not? Either way, I think that's going to be very interesting. Uh, Petra wasn't in this episode, so I already talked about where I think she's going to go. But overall, guys, really good first half of the season. I really enjoyed this first half overall. I thought there was some really great stuff uh, in this first half of the season. It was very straightforward. It was very simple until the end. It got a lot more complicated. That's something I definitely really did love. No, I didn't think every arc was perfect, but compared to last season, I'm already enjoying this season a lot more. I think they've done a really good job making this season of change and revelation and that's something that was done very, very well to that effect this season, so far at least, and I'm very much looking forward to seeing where the second half is going to go, but overall guys of this video, hope you guys enjoyed the most you guys thought the first half so far, are you liking where it's going, do you not like where it's going, and I will see you guys in my next video, which will be for Ains of S.H.I.E.L.D., I know I have two episodes to review before the finale, and I will see you guys for that, okay, bye.